or someone sent me this actually is this a good video chaos is a pattern that we can't comprehend Se secret schizophrenic logic knowledge the way that human beings interpret the reality around them is via patterns what we term today knowledge and understanding is simply pattern apprehension. Everything that we consider to be true is simply something that we have distinguished as a pattern. If I drop something, I know that it's going to fall every time. Someone saw that and realized that hey, that's a pattern. And if you take an object and throw it, there is a path that it follows each time. There is some sort of way that it behaves that occurs each time, which we call trajectory. Everything that you see is a pattern. Everything that you consider to be true and real are patterns. This goes from the laws of physics to the clothes on your body, that you are the result of a bunch of patterns acting out from your heartbeat to your breathing to the life cycle of your cells cycle implies pattern even the the atoms that are vibrating within your body right now they are vibrating in a pattern and at the end of all of these various conjunctions of patterns there's you Reality is comprised of this infinitely dense interconcatenating assortment of patterns. And for whatever reason, what the human being is able to do, it is able to perceive and understand these various patterns. We are able to distinguish patterns from each other, but not all patterns. We are nowhere near being able to perceive the totality of the patterns that make up reality and this is the idea that i want to explore many of the things that i'm going to say are going to sound far out but i assure you i am not schizophrenic <laughs> i'm going to thread together some ideas dealing with consciousness frequency dimensions i know as i list them off it's easy to put me in some sort of box but the way that i'm going to dude he that sounds to way cool. Merge them all together. By the end of this video, you will at least have heard things from a different perspective. So as I was saying, reality is comprised of all sorts of various patterns. Reality is the expression of patterns. Even the way that we today measure intelligence is by your ability to apprehend patterns. If you have ever taken any sort of IQ exam or some sort of assessment to your cognitive ability, that is what it is comprised of. All of the questions deal with oh, wait, should we, we'll keep watching consistently some repeat. But if you look at it from this perspective, what does that say about reality itself exactly? That anything that consistently repeats, the measurement of anything that consistently repeats in any given amount of time is called a frequency. Another somewhat synonymous term with this is cycle, but cycle and frequency are more or less synonymous. It's just a different style of language to measure the same phenomena of how often something repeats. So if you look at it this way, reality is reality. It is comprised up of all of these various patterns that have various frequencies or various cycles. And the human, the human being, for whatever reason, we are able to interpret some of these patterns, some of these cycles. Some of them are rather obvious and undeniable. Others might take a little more work to be able to perceive, but no matter which way you flip it, whenever we come in contact with many of these patterns, they imprint onto us. We are able to cognize them and see that they are when you really think about it, this is the way an antenna works, that you have all of this energy, all of these various frequencies, and it is able to pick up on some of them and trans translate this, fr this frequency into some sort of usable information. This is what we do as human beings with reality. But the catch here is... If you look at the antenna metaphor, that antennas don't pick up on all of the energy bombarding it. There are a certain range of frequencies that it is able to actually interpret. And the rest of these frequencies, all of the frequencies that are outside of its range, 
it just appears as some sort of static. These out of range frequencies are what I will talk about next. That to us, these out of range frequencies, this static, it appears to us as infinite complexity. What infinite complexity looks like is what we all commonly term today as chaos. This whole idea of chaos is rather interesting. That if, as I previously stated, reality is comprised of patterns. Patterns is anything that consistently repeats. Anything that consistently repeats fundamentally makes it predictable. There is predictability embedded in what a pattern is. And on the other end of this, you have what we colloquially term today as chaos. Chaos is unpredictability. I know that there is a mathematical definition and a more academic term, but I'm speaking to the common man here, that on one end you have pattern, and on the other end you have unpatterned. On one end you have predictable, and on the other end you have unpredictable. And what lies in the middle of these two poles is a sliding scale of complexity. This term complexity is more of a judgment call on how difficult something is to be perceived as a pattern. This is a judgment call that varies from person to person, perceiver to perceiver. This is why we would all score differently on the IQ assessment. There are patterns that are simple for you to see that perhaps I cannot see. It's rather complicated for me. And on this scale, on the pattern end, on the, on the furthest end of this scale, you have patterns that are we agree that are undeniable. These are the so-called truths. And on the other end of chaos and unpredictability, unpattern, you have forms that no one can apprehend. Infinite complexity is... Here, I'll go read... Here, let's read some Philosopher's Stone real quick. This is a little mess of a show, but like, whatever, right? We're talking about all the things we like. Okay, this was a thing, too, that was important that I feel like was a good thing to understand. The alchemists agree that the stone develops and operates from the combination of female yin and male yang principles. Everything contains these two forces in different proportions, and the most stable proportion, proportions are not 50-50, but with either one of the two dominating. That, this is why the Philosopher's Stone comes in two forms, the Red Stone, male, and White Stone, female. This is also the relationship between gold, male, and silver, female, and why the Red Stone transmutes metals into gold, whereas the White Stone transmutes them into silver. Of course, when we say that gold is male and silver is female, this does not mean that gold is all yang and silver is all yin. Everything contains both but with one of them dominating for the time being. Furthermore, we can clearly see the relationships between male and female principles in nature. The two depend upon each other. Obviously, we have the fact that animals come in male and female genders who are attracted to one another. Also, the relationship between ma animals, male, and plants, female, is of the same type. We also depend upon each other for survival. The male force is the active force, growth and multiplication, whereas the female force is the passive force, stability and dissolution slash decomposition. Too much male force will end up multiplying and overpowering its surroundings, leading to destruction. Too much female force will reverse development, reducing everything to its components. Together, the male and female forces combine with the male force expanding and developing and the female force keeping it under control and everything orderly and harmonious. The male force attempts to impose itself upon everything. It wants to multiply itself. The female force, on the other hand, tries to bring everything back to its original element. It is the female force that allows for rebirth by encouraging reduction and decomposition back into the original element, supporting and nourishing this for the task of the male, which is to encourage growth, development, and multiplication. Imagine the world was only full of men or only full of women. The men would spend the whole time fighting in, in their efforts to impose their views and themselves on the rest of the world. The women would sit around and talk all day. Thoth is a bit of a misogynist. I kind of like that about him. I think it's funny. <laughs> he's an old, he's an old, you know, he's, he's a little old guy. He's old fashioned. <laughs> Developing nothing. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, dude, whammon, am I right? <laughs> I'll consider animals and plants. The plants have a lot of yin. They just sit around all day and don't even try to move, whereas the animals are busy running around and eating everything that it can put in their mouths. The sea has a dominating male force, which is why fish are so obsessed with eating each other. It's also why there are very few plants in the sea. Even the coral are animals. The air has dominating female force. Therefore, lots of trees and comparatively few animals in between. The genders are one manifestation of the yin-yang principle, but on a more fundamental level, it is these two forces constantly pulling back and forth against each other in a tug of war, and so create the cycles of nature. Yin-yang is polarity. We live in a universe of opposites. The cycles we live in nature are all due to the polarity of our universe, and it is these cycles caused by yin-yang which themselves cause growth and development of all things, from the atom to the whole universe itself. The Philosopher's Stone also develops from the yin-yang principle of polarity. In the natural development of the stone, and therefore everything else, the dominating principle moves to and fro, from yin to yang and back, in the form of evaporation and condensation, sun and rain. In this way, the stone develops to higher and higher degrees of perfection. <sighs> Dude, we're going to be making stones. We're going to be making kidney stones soon enough. Soon enough, boys. The garden is doing great, actually. It's popping off. Here, I'll show you. I'll show you what I can. It's been raining really hard the last couple days, but um, see, we've got... Here, let me open this window, actually. It's going great. I'll make a video. I'll make a TikTok later and show it to you guys. But we got in most of our plants. I had a I'm going cucumber crazy this this summer cuz at the end of the year that's like all I care about anyway. I just want to make massive amounts of pickles. Um and I feel like I usually do try and do too much and then I end up fucking myself and like I'll try and do like eggplants and corn and fucking everything. And I, you know, I only have like a four by 10 bed down there and it gets like half sunlight. Only the side closest to me gets sun. So we just decided that we we're just going to focus on the stuff that we know is good and that works down there. And that's tomatoes and cucumbers. And, and then, yeah, I have a couple eggplant, a couple squash, zucchini stuff that I'm trying for fun. Um, cause the zucchinis came in pretty good last year. It's just the room, like the those plants take up a lot. So, um, but I don't know. It's great. I love it. I think it's so fun. It's so cool to watch. You know, I always joke like, where does the fuck, where does the plant come from? Where is it coming from? Is it coming from the ground? Is it coming from the air? Where is this freaking plant coming from? And, you know, you just watch it over the months. Like, I grow them all, I start them all inside here, and it's crazy to just put a seed in dirt, and then in, like, two days, it's this big. Three days, you know? It's awesome. I don't get it, but I love it. And, and dude, it's like, it has, it gives you a new appreciation, you know, like, uh, Alive and Kicking, that, that guy who walks in the woods, he... He always talks about how everything's conscious. I mean, all these people do. All the people that we're listening to about this shit, right? Talking about plants being conscious and, like, I think until you, like, grow them, you don't really understand that. And But I do think that there is some consciousness in, like, everything, you know? It gives you a new appreciation for life and for, yeah, your the stuff that you eat and... I don't know. I, I think I think if everyone like everyone who can and is able even just doing like little container gardens and stuff like most of my stuff is not even in the ground. It's in just buckets um, and like using up some of the plastic and shit, you know, that like we just throw away all the time. Uh, it's cool. It's awesome to watch. You know, you th I have our compost down there, too, and we throw everything in there. Uh you know, like everything that you're supposed to, but just to watch it turn into freaking dirt over like a month. And, you know, when Lisa and I started doing this courtyard, like six or seven years ago, 
the dirt was straight ass, dude. It's it was bad. But now when you dig through it, bro, all I do is cut through earthworms and stuff because they are having the time of their life in there. So I don't know. It's really cool. It's dude. And then the weirdest thing is just the the life that comes. You know, the I'm in Brooklyn. I I've never seen bumblebees until I started doing flowers and stuff down there. So now it's like a cool little ecosystem. My my next door neighbor, she's got like, she's got a really cool garden, courtyard, backyard situation. Cause our our apartment is like back off of the front house, like like it's basically these like kind of houses you would have like a big ass backyard, but we have another. Our building is like a two unit building in the end of the backyard almost. So we're not on a street on either side, but um, but yeah, between our courtyard here and then Annie next door, she's got like freaking, she's got a huge walk around like courtyard garden thing. And we get like tons of wildlife. It's really cool. Um, And you would never think beforehand, like that you would get that kind of stuff in Brooklyn, but dude, that they, they, uh, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> it's cool. It's really cool. And I think it does a lot of good. And also this year, I think, like, <laughs> fingers crossed, but I haven't seen any of these fucking lantern flies. I think we did some serious damage last year, hopefully. I do every single one I ever saw. I smooshed it. Sorry. Sorry, can't be having them lantern flies in here. They, like, ooze. They make this, like, weird secretion. That gets on everything, dude. It's disgusting. They're vile. And they don't belong here. Sorry, buddies, but... <laughs> I am I'm, I'm uh, I love everyone except for lanternflies. They have to go. They're vile creatures. <laughs> so, yeah, no lanternflies this year. So, garden's popping off. I'm kind of... I, I'm, honestly, I think it's probably for the best that I took the stuff off the roof. Because... Sometimes I would uh forget about it, you know. And I have them in buckets that are supposed that are like self-watering, but I think actually having like direct sunlight on some of the plants that I had up there for like the whole day, I think that kind of burnt would burn them up. Um and yeah, especially if I'm not watering every day to like cool them off a little bit. So it's nice having them all down in the courtyard, but yeah. Thanks for asking. It's all it's, everything's going great. Hell yeah. I'm going to make so many pickles. And, and dude, the pickles that I'll share my, my sister-in-law's recipe, my sister, Jessica, she makes the best, it's just vinegar, dude, it's just like three ingredients and they're better than any pickles you've ever eaten in your life. Um, so I'll share that sometime. Heartbreak. Oh, that's a good point. I've been meaning to, I keep forgetting every time I pass like a hardware store, I need some fucking dill. Cause I keep, I keep getting to tomato or cucumber time and then i'm like frick i didn't plant any dill what an idiot so i need to go do that I need to get me some dill because yeah i want some i want some homemade dill but you know it's just like trying to do whatever you can like i'm sure you guys are doing this too probably out of necessity more than anything but just slowly trying to get off of their system fully you know like i think that you know in the next couple years they're like their system is about to is crumbling already you know like the the supply chain and stuff so everything that we can do to help get ourselves a little bit off of their system at least even just to start you know like learn how how many tomatoes you can plant in 20 buckets or 10 buckets or five buckets or whatever you know like I don't want this to happen, but like, you know, in the future, <laughs> there might be, come a time when it's like, you're kind of on your own, you know? So try and learn to be self-sustainable. Try and learn, ha- uh, get to know your neighbors. That's honestly a huge part of it, I think. Like getting to know everyone and like offering to help when help is needed or asking for help when you need it, you know? Like people like to come together in communities and stuff, so... Yeah, I think the garden stuff is like really important, especially if you're able to. And and yeah, if you have like like it just makes everything better, dude. I don't know. It really makes 
really makes me like happy to do it. It's so nice to just put your headphones on and go water some plants and clip clip the dead shit and you know trim up your tomatoes so that you you know like you you'll keep getting new branches that there's like the stalk and then the leaf and then you'll get a middle thing that comes out and that's going to be like a new I forget what it's called it's like a new leading branch or whatever it'll make a whole new plant if you leave it but if you clip those it'll make the the tomatoes on your you know on the on the ones that you didn't clip it'll make them all boost and get bigger this year too what we tried is that I haven't been doing that I wish I had been doing previous years is burying the tomatoes super fucking deep like uh I let the tomato plants get a little bigger like a foot at least and then you bury that whole motherfucker all the way up and if it's really big you can bury it laying down and just have the head sticking up so it's got like all of this is was the stem but it'll turn into root and every branch will turn into a freaking root you know so I heard anyway and then you just got this little piece sticking up and then once once you get into like producing fruit time since it'll have so much more root area that's pulling from the ground and water and whatever, it'll be able to fill the berries better and bigger, plumper, faster too. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's just I'm just trying to build on. I'm just trying to build my skills. You know, like I suck at it. I'm really bad at it. <laughs> I have like uh, but I've gotten a lot better from where I was. You know, and just take it a little bit at a time and. One, dude, once you start seeing the planties come in and and stuff, it really it's really freaking cool. You'll like you'll probably want to do more just from watching it, you know. So I think everyone should. I think it's important. It's like, dude, kids should start like kids should be taught like actually have having to plant plants and stuff. Like I feel like that gives you I don't know, I shouldn't have figured out or like found out about how sweet plants are at like thirty, you know. I feel like it's something that everyone would enjoy. Some form of chaos. But 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 you can't enjoy it too much because if you like if you just don't eat food that is processed and from the store and in plastic, uh you will kill all of these food providers for us, you know? All these capitalist men, wh- wh- someone has to keep an, a lookout for them and make sure that they're doing okay. So don't 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 go too crazy with the garden and totally get off of their system, you know, cuz what will they what what will they do? They're just going to have to be perverts to their own children and they're not going to have any money coming in. How are they going to continue being perverts? Us. You may have heard me say before on this channel it's something that I always say that reality is infinitely complex. What I'm ultimately saying is there will be a threshold to that you reach that everything will appear chaotic. And this is the key word here that it appears to be chaotic and complexity and chaos. Uh, I heard, well, Terrence Howard said a couple times that the universe is finite. That makes more sense to me. Kind of like that if it's true. Because, like, if it was infinite, it wouldn't break down when you get super small, right? Like, I feel like, isn't that the whole thing is that once you get small enough, everything breaks down. It's just like, you can't go smaller than that. Or or you get to where everything is so small and you're like, this is just vast open area where what is touching each other when you're touching, you know, when you push back against something, you're not touching anything. Apparently it's the forces of, well, magnetism is that what we're hearing magnetism pushing back back repelling the atoms from this thing so you're not actually touching isn't that crazy it's just the forces i don't know sweet though if it's true it's actually more of a judgment call it is a lack of ability of the perceiver to see and not the actual real state of things along the lines of the more academic way of viewing this there is a lot of research that goes into chaotic systems and you will see a large sentiment in a large a large group of people who argue that these systems are not unpredictable it is just it is just that the math to actually 
to rein them in and to make them to be able to be perceived as a pattern, the math is just too astronomical. Even with quantum computing, no matter how we try and slice it, it is just too much. We cannot even solve chess. You know, chess is this simple game with these locked fi fixed rules and pieces. And there are so many possibilities, so many different ways the game can be played. We just can't calculate it. The math is too astronomical. In other words, just because we are not able to perceive the pattern there, that doesn't mean that there isn't there isn't one. And it is more of a deficit or inability of the perceiver and not the phenomenon itself. Or as the kids say today, skill issue. It's kind of, you know, going back to the antenna metaphor that there are there is a range of frequencies that it is able to deal with. But the ones that lie outside of that, it doesn't mean that they aren't there. It just doesn't register to it. It doesn't quote unquote perceive them. I was watching a video of how chaos is represented via the pendulum and it was uh, some sort of Instagram reel. It was a live demonstration of pretty much how chaos works. But then something funny happened. The video repeated, and on the second repetition of the video, I realized that now this, this once chaotic, unpredictable event is now suddenly completely predictable. It is now a pattern. And amongst the study of these chaotic systems, there is this idea that if you could somehow rewind the hands of time to the beginning, if you pressed play again, would everything play out exactly the same? This is a thought experiment that's rather impossible for us to carry out because we live within this third dimension and we cannot escape this experience of time or essentially for us everything happens for the first time the first time and there is no undoing that however it does suggest that chaos is time dependent and it really got me thinking and the more that i talk oh yeah dude chunks always knows when i fill the feeder buddy you gotta share with the with the birds too okay his his cheeks are like he moved into the to the house too. I made that for the birds. They don't want to hang out in it. So he moved in with his baby. Talk the more far out things are going to sound. But if you approach things from the perspective of th there are these various dimensions. The way that I define dimensions is any lens through which reality can be interpreted. This is just my own semantical take on it. I believe that the lens through which reality can be perceived, the amount of them are infinite or at least seemingly infinite because I believe that reality is infinitely complex or you could view it this way. Reality is infinitely complex. So how many different ways can you plug into it? How many different ways can it be perceived? For us perceivers, us 3D perceivers, human beings at least, we have five main ways. We have our five senses, smell, touch, sight, uh, sound, and taste. To me, each of these represent some sort of different dimension. They are a unique a unique avenue through which reality can be perceived. There are more. I believe that there are an infinite amount of these. I believe that the the six main questions that we are able to ask, uh, who, what, when, where, why, and how, I think each of those represents its own dimension. Because when you really think about it, there is only about six different questions we can ask or six different domains of questioning. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And we combine all of these various domains, you know, the five senses, these, this ability to question. We combine all of these in various ways and we are able to perceive all sorts of patterns as a result of it. However, if you think that reality is so simple that via six domains of questioning, six lines of questioning that you will be able to perceive. Yeah, you can't go smaller than quarks too, right? That sounds finite, right? And I bet that there, you get big enough that it stops too because the whole thing is that it's like it's all one reflection coming from one source the the almighty source right and it eventually breaks down if you get too big or too small so i think that's finite it in its totality I, i've got a bridge in brooklyn to sell you and that these restrictions are pretty much not the Hell's Gate, because that's coming down, or the George Washington, whichever the one, whichever one the FBI chooses, but one of them's coming down. 
enrich our bandwidth as an animal. This is the range of frequency that we are able to perceive as entities. And anything outside of this just appears as chaotic to us. But going along with the more academic way dimensions are viewed, that I forget how many exactly, perhaps it's up to 11 or something, but the fourth dimension is widely perceived as or agreed upon to be this dimension of time. This isn't friend science. This isn't far out thinking. This is just widely accepted within academia. And it got me thinking that, for example, when I was watching this chaotic system play out, the double hinge pendulum, how would this appear to an observer within the fourth dimension? This chaotic system, this thing that we cannot see as pattern, for all intents and purposes, it appears to us as static. It is outside of our mm -hmm. ability to apprehend it as a frequency. When you die, you go to another life. Maybe heaven, maybe purgatory, maybe hell. These are the kind of questions. How would this appear to a perceiver within this fourth dimension of time? What I actually believe is, it would appear to it as some sort of pattern, or more accurately, some sort of object. This is where things get rather wonky. Reality is comprised of all of these infinitely dense overlapping patterns, and they are emitting all of these various frequencies. And the range of frequencies that you are able to interpret from reality is where you intersect with reality. We are conscious beings that intersect with reality in the third dimension. We are 3D perceivers. We exist. We perceive things as matter. This is the world of the material. But just because this is where we intersect with reality, that is not an indicator of what reality actually is. And this 3D perception, this material world that we are perceiving, we are digging and finding out that it's not exactly material at all, but rather it is comprised up of all of these various patterns. It is